I don't know what it takes sometimes for us to get there spiritually, but I believe there's so much more to come. And um, if you had been out all week to prayer, we had between, I would say it was 50 to 100 people every night, so five nights in a row. Some of the seats are empty this morning, but I say this to you, and lots come to the second service, as you know, it's been equaled out more now. But I say this to you, it was so impressive to see so many people out all week long, and every night somebody different. God is doing something at MGA. There was a power on Wednesday night. There was probably over 100 people here. But when we came together for prayer, it was truly the anointing was here, the full measure. I, I felt like, I feel like sometimes when we go to prayer some of those nights and God seems to take over, like the roof wants to open up and heaven wants to come down. The kingdom is about to come, I believe, in greater measure. And so if you're not here, you don't experience that. And for you that are missing out on prayer sometimes, folks. Prayer is not about us. Prayer is about us engaging with God. And so sometimes when we feel it has to be a certain way for us to pray, that's the wrong concept. We come no matter what. We bow down. We put our face to the ground no matter what, and God is going to show up. God is going to open up the windows, and His glory is going to descend. And it will descend for those that come, that cry out, that are, are, that are just urgent for God to come into their space. And I believe that, and that's what I'm talking about this morning. Are you hungry for God? Because I believe this year there is going to be transformation taking place wherever God is invited to come. And so as I speak this message, I pray you will realize that this is something that God's laid on my heart, but on many people's hearts. It's nothing new under the sun. God is encouraging a body of people to rise up, to be, and to, you know, just be the body of Christ out there more than even in here. But folks, every seat should be filled because we are commissioned to go and ask somebody. And we're compelled and we feel it necessary to ask somebody to church. And I say that to you this morning. I pray God will lay that on your heart this week. Church is not about you and I, it's about Jesus Christ. We come here, we gather in his name, but I believe there are many that are in so bad a shape out there. And as we talked about this past week, of all the young deaths of young men and women that's going on in our society, and I read an article this week that said Fort McMurray has one of the highest suicide rates for young people, especially young men, at the age of between 26 to 32, and uh, you you can ask people around that are in the industry, and they will tell you that's true. We bury more young men than anybody else, I, any other church, I believe, in town, but we see so many uh, families come through here with young men that have passed away, their sons, their grandsons. It's heartbreaking. And God wants to change that. Do you believe that this morning? God does not a God of death. He's a God that's alive and wants to produce life in young people's hearts and minds. I believe most Christians want to see God's glory. You want to see it in your life. You want to see it in your family. You want to see it in the church. I do believe that, but I do believe we don't have the zeal, the passion to move towards it. And why, you might ask? Well, usually when Christians meet, they talk about maybe their own interests. They talk about what's going on in church. They talk about different viewpoints of church. They talk about theology. But we don't talk about our daily experiences with God. Now many know it's your testimony it's the real thing that you live that's going to get you there. When is the last time God showed up in your day and did something fantastic? And God is alive and ready every day. And I want to say to this to you, in the book of Acts, they didn't have to worry about yesterday's man and what was happening yesterday because today was a brand new day and new things were happening today. And sometimes we're talking about things that happened three, five, ten years ago, and God is saying, I'm past all that. I'm in the future. What are you believing for tomorrow? <laughs> yes, God wants to move tomorrow. He wants to move today, actually. But, you know, this moment, I'm speaking, within a minute, it's gone. My words are gone. Everything is gone. And it's only the present that contains Jesus. And so Jesus wants to come in such a way that, that the New Testament will reveal to you that there's a new day coming, there's new beginnings, there's new, I think, fruition within us to say, we've got to get out, we've got to do more. And I think at prayer this week, we felt that. Those that were at prayer, we have an expectation that God is going to show up, that God is going to do something more in all of our lives. The things we get upset about, folks, 
in two or three years won't even matter in most of our lives. Do you know that? It's only for somebody to strike your family with cancer or one of your family members to be stricken with cancer. It's only for your marriage to start to unravel. And you realize all the other stuff don't mean a whole lot. But you realize you desperately need God at that point. And it's only God that's going to get you through. It's not always the person next to you sitting in the pew. It's God Almighty that has the answer. It's God Almighty that can heal. It's God Almighty that will work in your life to do. We worry about performance rather than an intimate relationship with God. We, we worry about the church, what it looks like, what it feels like for us, who is doing what right, instead of just worrying about where is God in my life. Where, because you see, if you catch on fire, and the next person catches on fire, and the next person on, catches on fire, you ever see when you hit a match and it hits the next one and it hits the next one, and all of a sudden you've got a bonfire? Well, that's what needs to happen in the body of Christ. We need to catch the fire. And then we need to ignite somebody else's life because we're so passionate, we're so excited about God, and God is doing so much in our life that you can't help but go tell it. You've got to get out there. Because most of us aren't aiming for anything too great or anything more than what we have, we get annoyed by other people's experiences. And that's the truth. We think we have life together. We have food on our tables. We've got good beds to sleep in. Our family is doing good right now. So we don't have need of much. So we don't go after much from God. But the book of Acts annoyed people back there. When they were healing people, when they were going around and talking about Jesus, when Peter was going into the Sanhedrin and said, you who crucified him, you who've done this. But you know what? Those that caught it, caught it good. The apostles caught it. They went about, they were willing to lay down their life after they'd seen what Jesus went through. You and I know the story of the cross, and more blessed is he who haven't seen that you and I than even the apostles. So God is with you and I even more since the cross. The work of the cross is with you and I that we can go out and do great exploits in his name. We're not limited. The power of God in us can do great things. Do you believe in for that? This has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your performance. It has nothing to do with my performance this morning. It has to do with him and totally him. And once we get that, once we get that it's all about him, we will cry out to him, we will seek him, we will search him, we will go after him till we find him. And we will find him, folks. The Bible says, if you seek, you will find. That's the promise of the book. So anybody tells you you won't, that's a lie. You will find Jesus Christ. We spend much time by ourselves sometimes. Or when we're together even. And we're not in awe of the fact that we can commune with God. That should be the greatest thing that, we're, that strikes our heart on a daily basis, that this great God allows you and I to come into the Holy of Holies and speak to him, that you can have conversation with him. And sometimes we take that for granted. We don't talk to Jesus for weeks. And then we wonder why life has gotten out of hand. We haven't consulted him. We haven't consulted his wisdom. We haven't gone off after him to get the answers for life. But communion has to be a big part of our walk in 2019. And that's what I'm here to tell you this morning. Jesus wants you to come. Jesus wants you to come into his presence. He has lots for you. Is God disappointed with us? Because we've all failed at this, by the way. No, God is not disappointed. God knew that we were born in sin. He knew we'd screw up. He knew that we wouldn't get it. But don't you think he loves it when we get it? Don't you think he gets excited when we finally get who God is in our life and we're not dependent upon everything else? You can't even depend upon your partner, folks, to give you everything you need. They will never do it. We're human beings. We fail miserably at life sometimes. But God Almighty never fails. He is perfect in all of his ways. And he's working all things out to the good. So once you get that, your hope is not in people. It is in God himself. And I pray that you put your your belief in God this morning and not what it has to look like for you. If you want to see disciples made salvation, a generation turned upside down, a nation changed, you must stay on your knees, spiritually speaking. That don't mean we got to get down physically all the time, but you have to stay in tune with God. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that um, 
God is going to do some great things as we draw near to the heart of God. And for you that came out to prayer, bless you. May God give your time back. May he reward your family. May he bless your family for it. May he put his stamp of approval upon you. May God come divinely to your life and to your home and show you that prayer works. Psalm 63, 1, 5. I didn't put it on the overhead this morning. I figure with communion and all, sometimes we can have so much going on that we don't get the message. Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts after you. My flesh faints for you. What kind of position do you think he was in, David was in, to say my, my flesh actually faints for you, as in a dry and a weary land where there is no water? So I looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast life, love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. So what is he saying here? Usually we come to God in our desperate moments. We don't always come in the good times. We come when we have need of him. And God doesn't mind that, by the way. He knew that we would seek him out when we needed him. But David said this, but when I, be, when I basically looked upon you in the sanctuary, when I seen you, your presence came close, God, and I seen you, I seen the array of your glory, I seen who you were, and God, I was beholding the power and the glory of the Most High God. Have you ever beheld God's power and His glory in your life? Can you, can you say that this morning? Who here has witnessed God's glory? To see His power manifested or to behold it. And once we behold His power and His glory, steadfast light, love becomes our portion. We start to walk in love. We start to look in love. We start to behave like people who love one another. And that causes us, folks, as well. The glory of the Lord causes you to raise your hands, to lift your hands, to get excited about God. It says basically that it in, will satisfy your soul like nothing else will. It will make you fat in the spiritual once you see the power and the glory of God. So I don't know about you, but I want to behold his glory and his power. I don't want to do without that in my life. I want to see Jesus Christ new every day, new revelations, new dimensions, new aspects of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you do too, because once we go there, how many know that God's going to show up? Some years ago, you know, us older saints have seen a lot of God move. And so it's hard sometimes, and it gets frustrating sometimes trying to convince another generation or even our own people sometimes that have walked alongside of us that God can do great things. Now we know it's got to be a work of the Spirit and not just us speaking it. But I remember years ago when Greg Fraser, Pastor Greg Fraser was here, and we played a tape on staff at the time. I was an el uh, elder at the time, I think. We played a tape up in Nunavut where they started to worship God, and the worship went intense. And as they started to worship God, the wind of the Holy Spirit started to erupt outside of the building. And they started to hear it come closer and closer. People started to get really scared and they didn't know what to do. But it was coming so loud it overtopped the music. And it actually came in the building. The wind of the Holy Ghost came in and split the pulpit in two. And people were so nervous. Some ran away from God. Some hit the floor on their face. And they knew God had erupted. God had showed up. And what happened was the entire community gave their hearts to God. They took everything. Yes, give God a hand. They took everything in their homes that was not of God, every movie, every piece of music, everything that was in their bedrooms, everything that was in their homes, and they took it out in the streets, and they piled it up in the middle of the streets, their drugs, their alcohol, they piled it up, and they set fire to it. And amongst them were the police force, the law enforcement agency, the courts, everybody, the whole community came to God because the power of God hit the building. And you might say, well, is that just what you're, you know, you heard? No, we had the tape where it was recorded. Somebody was recording the music. And you could literally hear the wind 
and I still have it home somewhere, the wind coming through the building, and as the pulpit net split, and the people were shouting, he's here, he's here, he's here, and people were hitting the ground, and you could hear people's feet running. And Alistair Petrie, I don't know if you know of him, he goes about recording where God is moving, and he actually recorded that as well up in Nunavut. Can God show up? You've read other stories like that? See, once God comes, sin has to go. When God's presence comes, all that stuff has to move and shift, folks. Many people run away from God. They run from thing to thing. Someday they're on the high, the next they're on the low. But when we leave the presence of God and try to handle things on our own, we leave the maker and the sustainer of life. When you leave the one that gave you breath, when you leave the person that actually can give you hope and love on you like nobody else can, you've lost the greatest source of comfort and the person that will carry you in your time of weakness. Don't leave God. Don't walk miles in your own shoes without recognizing that he's there waiting for you to run to him. We used to sing that song, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's honey in the rock. That's from Psalms 34, 8. If we taste, if you get a morsel of God, if you get God, I believe with all my heart you can't go back, folks. Once you get a taste of God, you can't go backwards and say, well, this is not what counts anymore. I think your spirit yearns for more of God. How many can testify to that, that once you've got a portion, you've got to keep going. You've got to find out the next aspect of his glory. You want to see him some more. I believe those people in Nunavut were never the same. They always wanted that experience over again. But how many know God don't come the same way? He's coming in a new way. I believe this is a new era. I believe for Canada this is the new era. I believe God is going to explode in 2019. You get ready. You get ready. It's been too much prophecy. Most of us aren't hungry enough because we're filled up with other things. Our work is satisfactory. Our marriage, like I say, is good. We don't have no problems having money for a trip. We have no problems having all the things we need in life. So we're not that hungry for God. But let me tell you, if the world becomes much worse, we're going to recognize our need. And that's what all the pastors those leading the different organizations throughout Canada are saying, there will come a time when we won't have a choice but to bow our knee because we won't know where else to turn if God doesn't interrupt this year and change our nation around. The church is at work. Jesus started this church. Sometimes we write off church because we think it's about people. Church is not about people so much as you would think, not about the leadership. It's about you and I. You make up the church. You come to the church. You are the church. And sometimes we like to say it's all of that other stuff. But no, we are the church. And we have the power to make the church better or worse, depending on what we do. The work of the church that Jesus started and ordained for his purposes, that's the New Testament. That's where we're supposed to be still operating in the New Testament. But instead of the church bothering us, folks, and this is one thing that I prayed with not to grow weary in doing what's right in the sight of God. Rather than the church bothering you, you should be in awe of the church. Because this is not your church. This is his church that he's put his blood on, that he's put his stamp on, his stamp of approval, and it's full of imperfect people. But through the garbage of our life, his grace comes plowing through and it saves you and I and it redeems you and I and it builds you and I up and it encourages you and I to make us better people, to make us like Christ. And if we can't get excited about that, because you and I are sinners but by the grace of God and it's the grace of God that plows through our mess every day even here at church. It plows through our thinking. It plows through our humanness. So that God, Christ Almighty, can be seen in the midst of it. That God Almighty will come and run his church himself. And once we give over, once we say, Lord, have your way, God will do what he does. He will even shift things around, stir things up. 
so that his glory might be seen. Because God himself, his son, paid too big a price for him to let the church go. Now, he's coming back. The Bible says, and we sing about it, for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle that's been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And he's coming soon. I hope you get ready. I hope your heart is preparing for Jesus Christ to break through the skies into your world to take you home forever. Because that's about to come. If you feel the church isn't what it should be, this might seem, I'm not preaching, I'm preaching at myself as well. Because sometimes we can, I can get there and moaning and groaning. But God rebukes me. You want the church to be what it needs to be? Well, then maybe you're going to have to get up early before you go to work and meet with a group of men and pray like they did before they went to work in the New Testament. Is that what they did? They rose up early and they prayed. Groups of men, groups of women came together and they prayed. Then what else did they do? They sold everything they owned. And they gave it to the church. Said, you can have anything I have. It's all common good. Whatever I have, you can have. You can have my car if you need it. Are we that church? I don't think so. And then, they not only did that, but they decided to give up their job, their family, their very life to follow Christ. That's the church. Are we willing to go there? You see, we cannot murmur against God till we get some of this right in our spirit. We cannot keep criticizing what God is doing till we're willing to pay the price like the apostles were. And what does that mean to you personally? It means different things to different people. It doesn't mean tomorrow you got to go sell your house, your car. I'm not saying that. But what is it that God requires of you so that you will get to see his glory? Because there is a requirement. There is an obedience to every Christian's life where we have to go in order to see God. God wants you separated from the body. Why? Because he's a liar and a deceiver and he gets you to yourself. He can speak into that. God wants you together so that you can, this, iron sharpens iron. It takes the rough edges off us. It shapes us into the people. Marriage is made to make you holy, not to make you happy. Do you know that? Sometimes all we're looking for in marriage is for the other person to satisfy our needs, to make us happy, to make us what we need them to be. It's the same way in church. We want the preacher. We want the elder. We want the youth pastor, whatever it is. We want them to make us happy. But no, we are to give and take so that we become a unit that's so solidified that even hell can't break us apart. And if only we could get that across in our hearts when we're serving our husbands, when our husbands are serving us. I'm serving him because I love him and God has commanded me to. He's serving me because he loves me and God has commanded him to love me. And we both submit to one another because we love each other. Simple as that. It's not about me having to get my way, folks. It's not about him having to get his way. And when it does become about that, we're into disappointment and argument. But oh, when, you know, in those weak, weak moments when he can pick me up and in his weak moments I can pick him up and I can encourage him as a man of God and say there's so much more to come for your life and I'm believing in you and I believe God's going to make you the greatest man of God and you're going to go the distance and you're going to be everything God commanded you to be. How can you not get excited about that? And that's the way we should speak over one another, folks, over the body of Christ, over our young people. God has great things in store for us. Don't believe the church is dead. <laughs> I believe God is just beginning. I believe there's a new generation rising up. I believe there's a new era coming to the church. I believe God is just about to start to move by his spirit and his power. So you get ready for a better place in 2019 than what you were in 2018. And if we're growing in the spirit of the Lord, if God is increasing us by his glory, if it's ever increasing within us, this year has got to be better than last year. It just has to be. You don't seem that convinced. So what must we do? Let me do some concluding here. You must hunger after God. There's a whole lot of scripture coming. You must hunger, you must thirst after him. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. 
Psalms 143, 6, I stretch out my hands to you. My soul longs for you as a parched land. You must come, number two, to Jesus in faith. Psalms 42, 2, my soul thirsts for you, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before you, God? He was asking the question, God, I know I need to come. When should I come? Well, we should come every day before the Lord. John 7, 37 says, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, come. Let him come to me and drink. There's your answer. If you need more of God, if you're dissatisfied with life, if you can't get it together, if you don't know where God is, if you haven't got the, the understanding of what you need to have through the Word of God or whatever, you come to Jesus and He will let you drink and be satisfied. We're to open up to God. 1 Peter 2 and 2, like newborn babies long for pure milk of the Word so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Yearn for more of God. Psalms 81.10, I the Lord... Am your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. I will fill you to overflowing, the Bible says. John 13 to 14, in chapter 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up. Do you have a well of water springing up in you this morning? Do you feel it bubbling up to eternal life? This well that's within us, folks, this life that's within us is going to bring us to eternal life if we don't let go and we keep coming to Jesus. I'm going to ask the band to come back. John 6, 33, 35, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Talking about Jesus Christ here. Then they said to him, Lord, always, always give us this bread. Never let us go without Jesus. Never let us be disappointed, but let us ask for Jesus instead. Where does your hunger come from? Maybe you need to ask God to make you hungry, thirsty, because God said he put a hunger in the children of Israel. So that they would awaken, that they would cry out to him, that they would find food from him, the manna of heaven. He said, I humbled you to make you hungry so that you would come after me. What do you need to have in your life to come to God? So many people think they have to get life together before they come. They think that if I just do A, B, and C, and then I can come to God. But Isaiah 55, 1 says, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money or without cost. Doesn't matter if you're poor, you're rich, whatever you have need of, he says, come, just come. Revelation 21, 6 then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one, I will, listen to this, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life, which is Jesus himself, without cost. Doesn't cost you nothing to come, but you must come. You must walk towards Jesus. You must bow your knee and say, Jesus, I need you need you in my life. I have things here I don't know what to do with. So what does hungering after God do for us? Well, John 6, 35 says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger again. Spiritually, you will never need anything else, folks, but Jesus. You'll realize he's the author and the finisher of your faith and that he loves you so much that he's always there. And he who believes in me, you have to believe, will never thirst. So maybe you're here this morning and you feel like, I didn't know this Jesus. But I know I have lots of areas of my life that aren't good. I know I'm not satisfied with life. I know I don't know my purpose, my destiny. I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe this morning it's time to think about needing Jesus. 
the author, the one that put breath in your lungs and brought you into the world. Maybe that Jesus is somebody you should get to know. You know, we go down to Sunday school and we teach the kids powerful things that adults never live out. We teach them that God can come and God can save and God can heal and God can do all these great things. And as adults, we let that childlike faith be pushed aside so that we rationally try to figure it out ourselves and we let our own faith be diminished in a God that can. If you could bow your heads for this moment this morning. If you're here and you think this message this morning, Pastor Bev, is about me, I am hungry for something else in life. I am thirsty. I do need something. And I don't know what it is. I know I come to church, but I don't always go away fulfilled either. Well, the answer is Jesus. Simply Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you would like to invite him into your heart, I want you just to quickly raise your hand you would like to say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. So many young people raising their hand. Last Sunday, so many young people giving their hearts to Christ. Is there anybody else here this morning who would like to give their heart? Say, Lord, I want you to come in and be a part of my life. Jesus, by your spirit. You can repeat this prayer for those that raise your hand. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. But I also heard this morning that I can come to you. I don't have to bring anything to you. I don't have to do anything. That you will just come into my heart. So I invite you in. And I want you to come and be a part, like your presence would be a part of my life. Come that I might get to know you, see your beauty, see your glory. I invite you in this morning so you can be Lord over my life. For you that are here this morning, maybe you're here and you you thought, you know, Pastor Bev, we all know these messages. You don't say nothing new up here, folks. Hopefully we're just reminded of what the Bible already tells us. But there's scripture that talks about the we are the temple of God, but let the temple be filled with the glory of God. I don't know if that's what you want for your life this year, but that's my goal. God, let this temple be filled with your glory. Every believer, though, has to allow God to come, to be filled. We are supposed to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says one day he's going to come back and the whole earth will be filled with his glory. And you and I will be coming with him if we enter into death. We will come back with Jesus and fill the earth with his glory. We sing that song, New Wine says lay down the old flames to carry your fire today with that new fire comes new freedom new power make me a vessel an offering anything you want me to be are you willing for God to make you anything he wants you to be but bring but bring the new wine out of me as we stand I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to sing I'm going to ask very quickly for our men here this morning, any man that believes and wants God to do more in their life, I want them to come quickly to the altar. You believe that God's going to bring new wine out of you this year. There's a new beginning. There's a new season for your life. Would you quickly come? Jesus. Come, come to the table of the Lord. Come. I 
I ask for the men first because I believe God wants to raise up a nation of men that will stand on guard, not only for this church, but for Fort McMurray and for Canada. And I believe it's time that they arise in prayer and that we commission them to be leaders of our homes, of our nation. I believe that with all my heart. I'm not a feminist in any way, shape, or form. I want my husband to lead our home. I want him to be a man of prayer. I want him to covet God more than the breath he breathes. For you women, you want to be women of God? Come quickly. You want God to do something new this year that you've never had before. You see, the stepping out, folks, the, the moving forward, you have to come to God. He does not have to come to you, he's, although he's already just there waiting. He's waiting. But he says, come, find me, seek after me, pull on my heartstrings, move toward me. Just keep coming. Oh, God. We're going to sing this together, and then I'm going to pray over you. I believe a prophetic prayer. I want you to know this morning, God sees you as you move. God is destining your steps as you move. God is commissioning, opening doors right now as you've moved out. I believe that God has just opened a few windows of heaven for you. And let's go. Let's sing this together, and then we're going to pray.